Okay, should I start sharing? Or Yes, please. Uh, the recording has been started. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone, depending on your time zone. Uh, today we are together with Nikola Ilic, who is very well known for his passion in Power BI performance and also football team Barcelona, as far as I know. Uh, he is a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and we are so happy to have us uh, have him with with us today. I'm hand I'm handing over to you, Nicola. Thanks. Good thanks for you with us. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, yeah. Likewise. From my side, also good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as you know that we have uh, uh, people joining from all parts of the planet. Uh, and uh, yeah. So. Before we start, just a short introduction because Halil already mentioned key facts about myself. Uh, I'm living in Salzburg in Austria. That's the reason why I've chosen this nickname, Data Mozart. So it doesn't have anything with classic music or something like this. Uh, yeah, because Salzburg, <laughs> Salzburg is uh, uh, worldly famous uh, as a birthplace of Wolfgang you know, Mozart. Uh, so I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why I'm trying to make music from the data. Uh, other than that, you can find me on social me uh, social media like Twitter and LinkedIn. So feel free to connect if you like. Uh, currently working as an independent consultant and trainer, mostly with Power BI, but also with other data platform, uh, Microsoft data platform products. Okay, so let me be honest with you uh, at the very beginning. Uh, creating a Power BI report may look like an easy task. So you import the data, you you set those nice colorful visuals and your shiny dashboard is ready. However, one day you receive a phone call from the report user who complains that uh, the Power BI report is slow. Or what's even worse, your scary DBA walks into your office and asks you to explain why your report consumes all available resources. Or simply no one comes to you, but you realize that uh, uh, your report doesn't perform well. As I've already told you, uh, uh, creating a Power BI report is not a rocket science, but there is a huge difference uh, between the uh, between a Power BI report that just works and Power BI report that works efficiently. Now you're probably asking yourselves, if I have performance issues, where do I start? And that's a great question, believe me, because once you identify the area that causes problems, you are halfway through solution. OK, I maybe I, I like a little bit, maybe not halfway, but you can then shift your focus to finding a solution to a more specific issue. And when we are talking about specific issues, I would say there are at least five key areas to examine if you want to improve the performance of your Power BI reports. So those five key areas that we will talk about today is data model size, then data refresh process, DEX calculations, uh, visualizations, rendering time, and storage mode decision or storage mode choice. So let's go now and try to understand each of these areas in more depth. Uh, I want to show you some potential caveats and how you can uh, avoid or overcome them. And I will also share with you some best practices for getting the maximum performance from your Power BI report in multiple different scenarios. So the first thing I would like to discuss is your data model size. It is so important that in certain scenarios, for example, uh, when you're operating on Power BI Pro licenses, uh, which has uh, uh, which have a one gigabyte limit per data set, your solution simply can't be used if you reach that limit. Uh, data model size also affects our second talking point, which is the data refresh process. As you may assume, the larger the model, the more time and resources uh, is needed for data refresh. Uh, in the end, tabular model, which works uh, in the background of Power BI, is based on keeping data in memory, so in cache memory. Thus, the smaller the memory footprint of your data model, the faster it will be. Now, to understand what affects your data model size, we need to lay some theoretical background. First of all, uh, when you choose import mode for your data in Power BI, data is being stored in a columnar database, which is called VertiPack. Uh, VertiPack keeps the snapshot of your data in cache memory, and this snapshot can be then refreshed periodically from the original data source. 
to understand how things work in the background. You should be able to distinguish between formula engine and storage engine. Those are two key components of this underlying architecture. I won't bother you too much with theory, but some things are simple. Uh, simply, yeah, you, you must know it. Uh, so formula engine represents uh, a, a brain of Power BI uh, because it translates your DAX to a specific query plan that consists of different physical operations such as joins, segregations, uh, filtering, and so on. On the other hand, storage engine represents the muscles of Power BI. Why? Because it physically, literally physically goes through the data which is stored in tabular model. So, in other words, if storage engine needs to dig through massive amounts of data, it would obviously need more time and resources. I'll try to give you a simple analogy. Uh, uh, imagine that you have to find a book in your old attic. And what do you think? Uh, would it be faster and easier to find it if you have just a few items around or if your attic is in mess and full kind of full kinds of different stuff. I think you know the answer. So optimizing data model size is a broad topic uh, uh, and I have a separate session 60 minute session dedicated exclusively to this topic. So I want just here to uh, list some best practices related to a data model size optimization before I show you in demo uh, uh, what I'm talking about. First one is reduce the uh, reduce the data that you're importing in your data model and keep only those rows and columns your users really need in the report. I know that it sounds uh, uh, simple and uh, but believe me I saw uh, I can't tell how many cases where just removing unnecessary rows and columns significantly improved the performance of Power BI report. So that's the rule number one. Uh, we are talking about filtering data, so remove unnecessary columns uh, and unnecessary rows. How do you remove unnecessary rows? For example, if you don't need data from last five years, but only last two years, then simply don't import this unnecessary data. Uh, next one is also very important. Try to reduce column cardinality whenever possible. Uh, cardinality stands for the number of unique values in the column and uh, Vertipack uh, Vertipex uh, speed is based on data, among other things, of course, on data compression. And uh, when you have a lot of distinct values in the column, it's hard for Vertipack to optimally compress the data. Uh, it needs to use some special algorithms and so on and so on. Uh, in simple words, uh, the lower the cardinality of your column, the smaller uh, the size of that column and consequentially it will take less memory. So if you don't need data on a level of granularity lower than day, I would say in 98% of cases day level granularity is completely fine for uh, reporting purposes, then remove time portion of the data and that will significantly reduce the size of that column. Uh, I will show you in a few minutes uh, in one example what I'm talking about. Next one, avoid using calculated columns whenever possible as uh, they are not optimally compressed. Instead, if you need to do some calculations, push them to a data source like SQL database, for example, or perform them using Power Query Editor. Also, this one is uh, a problem that I saw in many cases. Disable auto daytime option when you load data in Power BI uh, because this will remove a bunch of automatically created hidden date tables in the background and instead always use a proper date or calendar dimension in your data models. So let's go to a demo and I want to show you one of these points in action. So let me just open Power BI Desktop and show you the table that I have. It's table, uh, simple fact table uh, contained, containing data about chats performed by customer support department. And you see that this table has around 9.3 million rows. So nothing special in terms of data volume. But the problem here is, and let me show you if I go to my Power Query Editor, the problem here is that uh, uh, level of granularity for my date column goes to a second level of precision. So I have a date time, date type, uh, and you see that uh, if I go back to the report, I have almost 9 million distinct values. So this is just a simple measure showing uh, the total number of distinct values in this column, almost 9 million distinct values in this column. 
And if I open Deck Studio from uh, directly from Power BI Desktop, let's see uh, what will VertiPack Analyzer tell me uh, how much space this table and this column occupies in my data model. So for those of you, I, I sincerely believe that all of you are using Deck Studio. If not, go immediately uh, to deckstudio.org, download this free tool. It's amazing. And uh, one of the coolest features seen is uh, VertiPack Analyzer. So if you go to advanced tab here on the top and click on view metrics, that will automatically launch VertiPack Analyzer, which collects data from different uh, uh, dynamic management views and present data in more uh, uh, structured and more readable way than uh, if you go and do that on your own by writing uh, queries. So you see that by chat table, as I said, Data Team Start UTC column has 8.8 .8 million distinct values, cardinality of 8.8 .8 million, and size of this column is 454 megabytes. So all of those numbers here are in bytes. So this column takes 454 megabytes of, of, of my table. It's 82% of the whole table and more than a half of, of the whole data model. So what can I do here? If I go back to Power Query Editor, and I will just simply change the type of this data column from date time to date. So basically we got rid of time portion here. I'll hit close and apply. And let's wait for a few moments for, uh, to, for Power BI to apply those changes. This shouldn't take a long. That's it. So now we have instead of almost 9 million distinct values, now we have slightly more than 1000. And let's see the impact that this uh, uh, simple change had on our data model. So I'll click again on view metrics. And if I now go to chat table, you see that date team start UTC column has 1356 distinct values. And instead of 454 megabytes, it takes now only 6.7 megabytes. So it's more than 90% of uh, savings just by changing data type. We don't need to analyze data on a second level of precision. So we simply got rid of unnecessary data, reduce the cardinality of the column and consequentially uh, reduce the overall memory footprint of our data model. OK, going back to our presentation next. Now that uh, you know how if, before that, uh, mm -hmm. Gina, can you could, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. So knowing calculated columns are less than stellar, partly because of the high cardinality, how do you weigh between calculated column versus making, say, SQL Server do the math when you're dealing with high cardinality results like sales time exchange rate? So yep. in both cases, it's going to be, boy, there's really high cardinality here. Um, uh, so just to be clear, we, we are talking about, sorry for interrupting you, we are talking yeah, about calculated columns in Power Query or Index? In uh, Index. Index. Uh, Power yeah. Query would probably just translate it to SQL, which would throw it back yeah, to SQL. Yeah, that's, that's what I want. Yeah, just, just to be clear. Sure, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, if you if you have high cardinality columns that you uh, where you can't do anything simply, like you said, uh, with the currency exchange rates, uh, what you can do if uh, to check, I don't know if currency uh, exchange rates go to, to what level of precision, so how many decimal places you have uh, after decimal point, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in certain scenarios where I simply had to, to reduce the data model size, for example, instead of keeping five uh, digits after decimal point, I reduce that to two. So basically this this will also sure. reduce the cardinality. But sure. it's up to you to to uh, discuss yeah. this with users if that's fine for them. So sometimes sure. it's not. So, but yeah. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, what you can do, you can split column. That's also reducing uh, technique for reducing the cardinality. So basically, you can you can split the column and uh, use, for example, values uh, before decimal point and values after decimal point in two separate columns. Uh, that will also reduce the cardinality, but it makes additional overhead then uh, on the report level because you can't write simple decks to to retrieve results. Uh, 
more complex measures you need to to include in calculations both those columns. Sure. Thank you. No problem. OK, so now that we know how to optimize our data model size, our data refresh process will run much faster. And that's true, but not in 100% of cases, of course. I mean, if that was simple as that, then uh, yeah, this session wouldn't have existed. Uh, as I've already explained, Vertipack keeps the snapshot of your data in memory, and then you are refreshing this snapshot from time to time, depending on your uh, specific business needs. So it can be uh, once per hour, once per day, once per week, once per month, and so on. Now chances are that you are applying some transformations to your data before you load this data to Power BI. That can be a currency conversion, that can be data filtering, renaming your columns, performing some calculations, and so on. So where do you shape your data? Source database. That's the most obvious choice and in most cases the most desirable scenario based on those traditional ETL uh, processes. Uh, if you don't perform data transformations on the source side, the next station is Power Query. Uh, simply said, Power Query is the built-in tool within Power BI that enables you to perform all kinds of transformations, I would say, to your data. So last time I checked in uh, official documentation, uh, you can apply more than 300 different transformations and that number is constantly increasing. The key advantage of Power Query is that you can perform really complex data transformations with little or no coding skills at all. And additionally, all steps that you apply during this data transformation process are being saved. So every time you go back and refresh your data sets, uh, your data set, those steps will be automatically applied and your data will be shaped and ready for uh, for the, the report. Uh, under the hood of Power Query is a very powerful mashup engine that enables your data shaping process to run smoothly. And Power Query uh, uses also very powerful M language for data manipulation. Now, why is this all important? Uh, for some data sources, I'm talking mostly about relational databases, but also for some non-relational data sources like all data or Active Directory or Exchange, uh, this mashup engine is able to translate uh, M language to a language that this underlying data source will understand. In most cases, this is this is SQL. Uh, why is that important? By pushing those complex calculations and transformations directly to a data source, Power Query uh, uh, takes advantage of these robust relational database engines that are built to cope with large volumes of data in the most efficient way. And that ability of Power Query's mashup engine to create one single SQL statement that will combine all M transformations that you've applied is what we are call uh, what we call query folding, or let's make it simple. Uh, if the mashup engine is able to generate a single SQL query that's going to be executed on the uh, data source side, we say that the query folds. Uh, again, query folding is an extremely important feature in Power BI, uh, uh, even though it's often overseen. Uh, but I like to quote uh, Ben Watt, our friend from Dublin Power BI user group. Uh, who call query folding unsung hero of Power BI, and I couldn't agree more with that. So query folding is unsung hero of Power BI, trust me. OK, I want to show you how this feature may increase or decrease effic efficiency of your data refresh process. So it's time for a demo, and uh, let me show you here. I have just a simple fact table from Contoso sample database that has 12.6 million rows. Now let's go to Power Query Editor and this one. OK, 12.6 million rows. Let's apply some transformations to, to this table and see what, what happens when query is folding or not folding. So first of all, I will show you what happen, what's happening when uh, we achieve a full query folding. So let's go and, for example, uh, I'll grab from Dim Customer Let's say first name, last name, and uh, gender. Okay. Then what else we can do? Let's do uppercase of first name. So I will go to transform and do uppercase. Then I will change data type of this 
uh, date key column from date time to date. Then what else I can do? Let's do a calculation of uh, absolute value of our sales amount. It doesn't make business sense, but I want to show you how how engine thinks. Uh, then let's do some filtering. For example, let's find uh, total cost. Do filtering where total cost is greater than let's say five. Okay, what else we can do? Let's re let's do a replace. Replace is a good one. So I will go to gender and I will uh, replace uh, F with female. OK, and let's do another filtering and let's say that we are interested only in those uh, uh, big sales. So I want to keep only those sales where sales amount is greater than. 500. OK. So we perform different transformations here, you saw. And uh, if I right click on this last step here on the right hand side, if I right click on this, you see this view native query option is enabled, which means that this query is folding. So I will click on this view native query. And now I'm able to see the SQL code that was automatically generated for me. So you saw I didn't write any single line of code and I have a SQL query that was that will be pushed down to a SQL database. And let me show you a few things that we performed. For example, here uh, you remember that we uppercased our first name, so it was translated to uh, upper function in T-SQL, convert uh, our uh, date time type to date, calculated absolute value, did the replace of F with female. So all of this was nice, uh, were nice, nice translated into SQL. But the most important thing here is down below. This one. This where clause. Why? Because that gives uh, instruction to SQL database that we want to keep just a certain number of rows. We don't need all. We just need those rows where sales amount is greater than 500. But let's let me stop talking here and let let's let me show you. Uh, the performance of this query. So this number should change now here, of course. And let's see how many rows do we have and how fast do we get data refresh? So we got 1.5 million rows in, let's say, 10 seconds, approximately 10 seconds. OK, now let me go back here. And I will now intentionally break query following. So please don't do this. This is just for demo purposes. What happens when there is no query folding? So I just want to show you the difference in performance. But whenever you see that query folding is broken, please investigate and try to achieve this uh, this behavior. So this one, this uh, uh, step transformation step where I change uh, the type of my date key column, I will delete this step. I'll do exactly the same. So I will in the end I should get exactly the same results. But now instead of using change type transformation, I will use transform and choose date only. Power BI asked me if I'm sure that I want to insert step because that can have impact, blah, blah, I want. And you see that you should see now that we will get exactly the same outcome in this column. So we just got dates, time portion uh, disappeared. Now if I go back to this last step, you see that view native query option is disabled. That means that query doesn't fold. And I could go to each of those steps and clicking and checking which one is uh, folding, which not. This is a little bit cumbersome in Power Query Online. You have nice icons that shows you for each step uh, if it folds or not. Here it's not the case, but uh, I will check for this uh, step that I inserted uh, now. It's disabled. So if we go to the previous step, uppercase text, you see that view native query option is enabled. I can click here and you see that again we have this upper transformation uh, translated to a T SQL, but no other no other transformations are translated, are not pushed to SQL. And what is most important? Nowhere close. Let's look, let's look uh, uh, what happens uh, when I hit refresh uh, for this. 
So I will hit close and apply. Now we know that we will get exactly the same. We should get exactly the same number. So 1.5 million rows. But now you see that it works slightly slower than in the previous case. So those batches of rows are smaller. So whenever you see that uh, that when Power BI is loading data, that these batches of rows are smaller, that's a good indicator that maybe query folding is not in place. But what is most important, we know that we should have 1.5 million rows. So why Power BI continue uh, uh, loading data? Well, because of this where close. Uh, I'll try to yeah mimic uh, what's what's happening here. So when we uh, when we have a situation like this, so when we are doing our transformations, Meshup Engine and SQL Server Engine communicate. And Meshup Engine says, "Okay, SQL Server, give me some data for my Power BI report." Okay, what data do you need? And then Meshup Engine, if query falls, I want this, 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 but exclude all rows that where sales amount is. Uh, a lower or equals to 500 and SQL Server says, OK, thanks. Here is your 1.5 million rows. Do with them whatever you want in the report. That's it. In this uh, second case, uh, Meshup Engine was not able to say, give me those rows where sales amount is lower or equals to 500. Uh, it said book, uh, 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 literally, give me all rows and then I will see what will I do with this. So because I don't know uh, uh, how to translate this to your language to, to the language that you understand. And in the end, you see we have exactly the same number, but instead of like 10 seconds, we had to wait like one and a half minute. And uh, my machine is pretty strong. So in, in uh, yeah, it, let's say with with uh, uh, yeah, uh, worse machines and uh, with more data, this is just a simple fact table, uh, no relationships, nothing. Uh, and just 12 million rows, so you can imagine the the uh, the impact that it has that it, it can have on performance uh, on the larger larger amounts of data. Okay, any questions? Maybe before I proceed further. Is there a way to correct this? Correct what? Uh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, I think I should be a bit more clear. So you just showed us query folding and you know you inserted a step in between. Uh, how do I undo this? Uh, how do I ensure that my query folds? I mean, I've already done such a mistake. Mm -hmm. So how do you correct this uh, step that uh, that breaks query folding, right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just go to this step and you can delete it from here. Clicking just on this small icon, you can delete this step. Uh, delete it and do it later on. Yeah, exactly. you can move it or, or you don't don't need to delete it. You can just drag it down there. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's awesome. a great point. And uh, uh, one of the things that I don't have enough time to mention regarding query folding is if you uh, if you identify the step that breaks query folding, but you simply must use it. You know, you can't do anything uh, else. Uh, you you need to keep this step. Then push it down below as much as possible. So push it, this transformation pipeline, as I like to, to call this one, this panel here, push it as much as possible down below. Because then all the previous steps will fold. As you see now with view native query for this step, we still get our where clause here and all the other transformations except this last one. So whenever you uh, 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 find this uh, this step that uh, breaks query folding, try to push it down. Great question, thanks. Thank you. OK, so uh, next one is also. Uh, ah, yeah, first best practices regarding data refresh, and there are many of them, so I will try to list only most important here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to recommend is fantastic blog post written by Phil Simark, uh, where he explained how you can visualize data refresh process and quickly identify potential bottlenecks. It's really useful and it's free, so go and uh, download this template that Phil uh, generously shared with us. Uh, some other general best practices in order to speed up data refresh process in general and keep query folding in place uh, would be, first of all, 
push your all calculations and transformations as close to data source as possible. Uh, for example, if you have permission to create a database objects, you can en encapsulate all the necessary transformations in the database view, and then you can import that view in Power BI. Views, same as regular tables, are foldable objects, so you can go and uh, even go and apply additional transformations in Power Query Editor over views. Uh, next one regarding uh, our previous uh, uh, question. Query folding is not all or nothing operation. That means if you have, let's say, uh, eight transformation steps within Power Query and your query folds until fifth or sixth step, uh, you will still get some benefit from partial query folding. However, once the query folding is broken, it can't be achieved anymore. And keep that in mind. And as I said, try to push all non-foldable steps uh, down this pipeline as much as possible. Uh, this one is also important in certain scenarios. Uh, turn off, allow data preview option to download in the background. Uh, why should you do this? Well, when you are in Power Query Editor, you see the preview of the data for every transformation step you applied. So when you hit the refresh button, it's not only the amount of the real data that gets loaded into your data set, but also a whole bunch of different queries to refresh this preview. And in some situations, these queries take more time than loading data itself. Uh, just one important disclaimer here. This uh, this applies only to Power BI desktop, so no service. So when you do this preview, turn off this in Power BI desktop. And if I have to choose one single rule regarding data refresh process, and let me call it a golden rule, uh, that would be push your transformations and calculations as upstream as possible and as downstream as necessary. It's not my sentence. I picked that up from Matthew Roche from Microsoft Power BI CAT team. And uh, please keep that sentence always in mind when you are doing uh, some transformations with your data. OK, now hopefully we are done with uh, those background problems and we are slowly navigating to a user interface. And honestly, that is the area of Power BI where performance issues are easiest to spot. I'm sure that sooner rather than later, someone will come to you and say, Hey, why is my report so slow? Of course, there can be a whole bunch of potential reasons, but uh, let's focus on a few that uh, are most often guilty for the bad user experience, which is caused by uh, uh, slow performing reports. So once you import the data in Power BI, I assume you will start writing DAX measures to satisfy different business requests. Uh, for example, you need to provide uh, your users with uh, the metrics such as uh, number of unique customers, uh, top performing products, running total of the sales amount, and so on. The beauty of DAX, and I've intentionally put this uh, double quotes around the word beauty, is that you can achieve the same result, the same correct result, in multiple different ways. Uh, I'll def definitely not go deep into DAX logic in this session, uh, explaining how DAX works uh, and so on as there are many people around who know DAX much better than I will ever know. However, there are a few certain situations that I spotted during my work with Power BI where little nuances in uh, your DAX formulas can take you in the direction that you wish to avoid. So let's go and uh, I will show you one basic example of how misusing DAX, uh, let's first close this, how misusing DAX uh, uh, can cause a significant performance decrease in your Power BI re report. Okay, so uh, this is my DAX. And here I have my orders, uh, big orders, so orders that are greater than 500 uh, broken down on a single date level. So I put this here just to compare because I want to run some performance tests in DAX Studio just to compare uh, the correctness of results uh, with this one in, in Power BI Desktop. Because don't forget, performance is important, but it's even more important that you have correct numbers. So it doesn't matter if it's fast, if it's not correct. So as I said, let's go to DAX Studio. And I'll switch this and let's turn on server timings. And let's write some simple decks. I mean, I will not write everything because you don't have enough time, but uh, let me first 
show you this calculation that we have in Power BI Desktop. So basically, let me just quickly explain. So basically, we are defining our measures where we want to calculate. Uh, ah, this is this is for unique order, so it's not the one that we want to calculate. Never mind. I will show you this one, which basically should return the same results as in Power BI Desktop. So we are just doing distinct count of uh, sales order numbers from our fact table, and we are filtering only those records where sales amount is greater than 500. So the same thing we did in Power Query. And basically here we want to summarize the results based on a, on a single date. So now if I go and uh, run this query, let's see how long it takes and you can you can follow uh, the current elapsed time here in the bottom right corner. It takes already 14, 15 seconds. That's really, really slow. First, let's go to results. Sort by date and you see that we have 653, 785. That's it. So we got correct numbers. That's 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 good sign. But why is it so slow? If we go to server timings here, you see that this measure took 70, uh, 17 seconds to execute. Most of the time was spent in storage engine, which is in theory good. But why is it so slow? So what happened here is that we have. Uh, uh, I just want to show you here uh, we have. 1097 storage engine queries. So if you take a look, each of these queries took 15, 16 milliseconds. So each of these queries uh, is fast, but there are a lot of them. What happened here is that formula engine, remember brain of Power BI, uh, had to, for every materialized table of data that was returned by storage engine, formula engine ran a distinct count against each this set of data specified in our filter condition date by date. So we had one query for each date. And now I guess you assume that has to be a more optimal way to obtain the same results. So I will show you this one was the, the total big orders bad. This one is a good. I will put it down below that uh, we can compare uh, the measure definitions and I will run this one. Clear cache and run. And you see this one returned Let's hope uh, the same results. Yes, the same results in 30 milliseconds. Now, just one storage engine query. What's the difference? Let me go back. Let me go back. In back, in both cases, we are using distinct count and we are using filter function. But in the first case, filtering function is really complex. In first case, uh, it accepts both table as an argument and column as an argument. So in the first example, we used table as an argument. So we materialized the whole table. While in the second uh, uh, second example, by combining filter function with all function, basically we re removed all the uh, current filters from sales amount column, except this one. So we keep kept only this where, uh, uh, filter where sales amount is greater than 500. And uh, that produced only one storage, uh, one uh, storage engine query, and we got our results back in 30, uh, 30 milliseconds. Another one, third one, is this one. So I'll again run this query. Let's check results. Again, same results. 33 milliseconds. Again, one storage engine query. This one and this one. So this and this, this is the same. This is just a so-called syntax sugar. So you can omit this part here with filter all and just put your filter condition uh, within the calculate function. But what will happen in the background is that uh, engine will implicitly wrap your code with this combination of filter and all. So these two are the same. And the fourth version, you remember that I told you that beauty of DAX is that you can achieve the same results in multiple different ways. The fourth version with uh, keep filters function, again, different than filter function, but in this case, 
should produce uh, the same output. So we again, we get the same results. Server timings, again, 31 milliseconds. Again, exactly the same uh, uh, execution plan and one storage engine query. So you saw that uh, we could have written this one measure in four different ways. And uh, uh, yeah, this was just a basic example, but uh, uh, you could have seen the possible implications to performance. The first one took 17, mil 17 seconds, all the others took 30 milliseconds. Uh, key takeaway from this uh, demo is don't filter when you are using a, a filter function, don't filter tables, whole tables, just filter columns that you need instead of this. Okay, going back to presentations and yeah, this is the most obvious problem I would say. When your report page renders slow, I can I can bet that uh, the report consumers will complain about the poor experience and ask you to do something, of course. So let's check what can be a root of the slow rendering. First of all, uh, Power BI Desktop offers a very, very handy built-in feature which is called Performance Analyzer. Uh, performance Analyzer enables you to capture uh, performance metrics for every single visual element on your report page. Uh, the rule of thumb is, as you may assume, the more visuals you have on your report page, the longer time you uh, uh, would be needed to render this page. And I'll show you in a few minutes how this looks uh, in reality. So let's go and open our uh, first page with visuals and I will turn on my performance analyzer here under view tab and performance analyzer and I will start recording and let's go and refresh our visuals. That was fast. Uh, you can sort by different uh, properties here. I want to sort by total time and I want to sort in descending order because that way I can immediately spot what is the slowest performing element on my report page. And it appears that this is the card that calculates total sales quantity. So all of these measures are uh, uh, very basic me measures uh, using simple aggregate functions like sum, average, mean, max, and so on. And you see that uh, if I expand this uh, this uh, 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 visual, I can see that DAX query took only 10 milliseconds. But let's say 95% of the total time was uh, spent on this other. Now you're probably asking yourself what the heck this other means. And that's that's a great question. So let me answer it. Other means how long did specific visual had to wait for all the other actions to complete before it could be handled. Uh, don't forget that formula engine works in a single threaded way, so it can't generate the DAX query for multiple visuals in parallel. So basically this card had to wait uh, for remaining nine cards to render before it could be uh, uh, handled. So I have 10 card visuals here and each of them displays a single value. Okay, let me show you another page. This one, let me just clear this and stop. We'll start uh, fresh. This one looks exactly the same, but the difference is that instead of 10 cards, I have two matrix visuals. So two matrix visuals, I spent some time. Yeah, I, I don't lie. I spent some time to format this, to, to you know, to place every, everything to look uh, exactly the same like in the previous case. But let's turn on our uh, performance analyzer. And now you see instead of, I don't know, 300 milliseconds, we have 85 milliseconds. And basically this is the feature called DAX Fusion, where Formula Engine is able to generate a one DAX query to populate the whole matrix visual with five distinct values. So in this case, instead of generating uh, 10 different DAX queries, Formula Engine generated just two DAX queries, one for the matrix on the top and one for the matrix uh, below and that uh, significantly improved the performance. Of course, with these simple things, uh, it doesn't matter if it's 300 milliseconds or 85 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds is fast, but uh, believe me, with more complex calculations and with more elements on the page, uh, there were savings like uh, going from seven, eight seconds of rendering to below one second. So it's uh, uh, order of magnitude like seven or eight times faster. So keep that in mind then uh, now when I list the, uh, the best practices regarding 
visual surrendering, I will mention this a few times. So first one, most important one, reduce the number of visuals on your report page. If you don't need a specific visual, simply remove it. Uh, also having multiple non data related objects. And when I say non data rela rela related objects, sorry, uh, I think about uh, shapes, text boxes, images, icons, they also impact rendering time. So it's few milliseconds here, few milliseconds there. But when you, uh, you know, when you add all of those uh, milliseconds, yeah, it, it can have impact. So if you plan to have a lot of shapes uh, and text boxes, uh, icons and so on, consider using PowerPoint. Uh, there you can create your desirable page design with all those uh, nice shapes, nice icons, text boxes and so on. You can save this as an image and then you can set this image as a page background in Power BI. So you have just one report element instead of potentially 10 or 15. Uh, reducing the number of visuals on your report page also means that like in our example, if you have a possibility to satisfy the business request by generating uh, one DAX query instead of five, you should tend to do it whenever possible. Uh, next one, try to display data at high level of grain. That means um, Vertipak is really brilliant in vertical aggregations, uh, but performs much worse uh, uh, on a detailed level uh, of reporting. With that in mind, if you have, let's say, a table with 40, 50,000 of rows and some measures being calculated for each row of this table, uh, you should be better off keeping this low level detail by taking advantage of, for example, drill through feature. So display aggregated data in the table by default and then give user a possibility to drill through to a, a specific single row if it's necessary. Uh, if you have a lot of visuals on the page, but don't necessarily need mutual interactions between those visuals, such as cross filtering, for example, you should simply disable that option. And also sometimes uh, sync slicers option can be performance killer. Uh, if you have multiple slicers, complex slicers on multiple report pages, and you choose to synchronize all of them, just make sure that it's not the reason for your reports poor performance. OK. Maybe I should have placed this uh, this uh, topic in the beginning as a decision. Which storage mode to use is one of the first you need to make when starting your uh, Power BI solution. However, I've intentionally left it for the closing part of the session. Uh, yeah, I think I have a, a good reason for this because I saw a lot of cases when someone thought that poor report performance can be improved by switching to a direct query mode and uh, leveraging capabilities of those uh, uh, robust database management systems that are built to efficiently cope with large amounts of data. How wrong is that assumption? I mean, those systems are built to cope with large amounts of data, but in completely different scenarios than your direct query storage mode in Power BI. Uh, before I explain you why you should avoid using direct query, uh, let me first explain what is a direct query at all. So when you choose direct query storage mode for your tables, uh, this means that data is being retrieved from the data source at the query time. And this also means that your data lives outside of Power BI in, in its original data source before, during and after the query execution. Uh, thinking that direct query will improve your Power BI report performance is one of the biggest fallacies. So direct query will never ever improve uh, performance of the Power BI report, period. Uh, to cut the story short, I would say you should use direct query uh, literally in three and only those three scenarios. First one, uh, obvious, your data size, data size is so large that you simply can't import it in Power BI. Uh, for pro licenses, I think I mentioned it's one gigabyte per data set. For premium, I think you you will rarely get into a situation that you can't import uh, data because uh, uh, because of the of the large amounts of uh, large amount of data. Next one is a requirement to have a near real time reporting solution. Uh, as you already learned, when you use import mode, Power BI keeps the snapshot of your data and. Now let's say that uh, the business requirement is to have data with maximum one minute or two minutes latency. 
obviously you can't refresh this data snapshot so so frequently to satisfy this request. However, don't fall uh, into the trap if your users request real-time data. Uh, believe me, when I ask users what is real-time data for you, I was getting answers like, "Yeah, uh, for me, real-time data is to have it to have the latest data every morning when I come in my office." That's real day, real time data for someone. For someone, is it okay to have it uh, after one hour, every one hour? Yes, it's real time. So for one hour, you can still set a, a data refresh and you can still use import mode. So don't fall into this trap. Explain your users all the possible downsides of using direct query mode. And from my experience, I would say 99% of cases, uh, users will admit that maybe they don't really need uh, real time data. And finally, uh, in situations where security policies are defined on the data source side, uh, as report consumers credentials will be then propagated uh, directly to this underlying data source and security rules will be applied there. If I still didn't convince you to avoid direct query or you simply must go this way, uh, there are certain, uh, certain rules that you should keep in mind in order to get the maximum performance uh, from direct query storage mode. The first thing is one huge if. So if you have permissions uh, to perform changes on the data source, there are multiple ways to improve direct query performance. Uh, first, you can create uh, proper indexes uh, to support your most frequently run queries. Uh, also, you should ensure that data integrity is in place. And finally, if possible, uh, create a persistent data objects in the database such as tables or even better materialized or indexed views, uh, which will persist all the necessary transformations and calculations. If you don't have access to an underlying database, you can still gain some improvements within Power BI itself. Uh, the most important thing is avoid complex Power Query transformations as uh, the SQL that is being automatically generated by Meshup Engine, it's correct SQL, but it's not always the most optimal one. Uh, if you need to use calculated columns, try to push their creation on the source database and if possible, keep them persistent. Uh, also avoid complex DAX measures. Uh, as your DAX statement needs to be translated to a SQL, again, keep in mind that this process can produce really expensive SQL queries. Uh, again, whenever possible, perform all your calculations on the source side. Next one, avoid relationships on GUID columns. Uh, GUID is a specific data type uh, in SQL databases, unique identifier. Power BI simply doesn't support the, this data type and needs to apply some uh, data conversion during the query execution, which affects the performance. The solution here is to convert this data type uh, within the source database before Power BI generates its own queries. Uh, limit parallelism whenever possible. Uh, you can define the maximum number of connections that direct query can open at the same time. So if you go to uh, file uh, options and settings options, and I think it's in uh, query reduction or not published data set settings. Yeah. So here you can sell, set maximum connections per data source. By default, it's 10 you can reduce this if necessary. And also under query reduction, you have some nice options to, to uh, reduce the, the number of queries that are being automatically sent to an underlying database. Uh, finally, uh, regarding data query, check assume referential integrity option. Uh, that will enable using of inner joints instead of outer joints with direct query. In theory, inner joints should perform faster uh, then outer joins uh, 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 in a SQL database, and uh, that can improve the overall query performance. Of course, as a prerequisite, you should have referential integrity in place within your source database. But I think I, I be believe that that's the case, nevertheless, of Power BI. To conclude, the best practice regarding Power BI the, uh, regarding direct query storage mode is avoid direct query if it's possible. And we covered a lot. Uh, maybe this talk is probably more for uh, suitable for at least 90 minute session, but yeah, let's wrap up the key takeaways from, from our today's session. I like to call it Monday to-do list. Yes, tomorrow is Friday, so you don't need to apply all of these things tomorrow, but keep that in mind for, for, for Monday. Uh, the key thing is to identify 
which part or which parts of your Power BI solution don't perform well. If you if your data model size is large, uh, consider removing unnecessary rows and column columns and try to reduce column cardinality, for example, by removing time portion like you saw in our example. If your data refresh process takes a while, check if the query folding is in place. In case that you identify the, uh, the step that breaks query folding, try to push it down the transformation pipeline as much as possible. Next, be mindful when you write decks to enhance your data model with additional columns and measures. Uh, for example, if you need to filter data, filter columns, not whole tables. Uh, next one, if your report page renders slowly, try to reduce the number of visuals on it. Uh, use performance analyzer to identify bottlenecks and don't use many visuals that calculate single value, such as card visuals, for example. Finally, stay away from direct query storage mode if possible and use it only in those three scenarios that we've already discussed. Now, of course, you should keep in mind each of these points, but if you ask me, one of them is slightly more significant, and that's the number one, uh, because identifying which part of your Power BI solution is the root of the performance issues will help you to concentrate, to focus on solving a specific problem rather than wasting time on less important stuff. I would say that's it from my side. Uh, looking forward to hearing your questions. If yeah, we have, we have a question from Gina. Uh, what about the you? What about using automatic the automatic uh, aggregations for direct query? It's still in preview. Uh, he haven't used it so far because it's preview. Uh, most of the companies uh, don't, don't. Yeah, prefer to wait until uh, some feature goes to GA. So uh, honestly, haven't tried it. Haven't tried it. Well, I can tell you my experience with aggregation, mm -hmm. uh, automatic aggregations, Gina. Uh, if you if you want to show the details, the the, the, the lowest possible details in your, in your in your report, then it's very close to Power Query per, uh, uh, direct query performance, because the idea with the automatic aggregation is to divide the fact table into two, uh, like header and details, and we make some automatic uh, aggregations on the header table. And when we want to drill down to the detail, the performance is more or less more or less the same. Yeah, thanks, Khalil. That's good to know. Yeah, that is good to know. Thank you. Actually, Microsoft is investing in this area. I mean, uh, getting reports as near real time, like uh, they announced another feature, which is called hybrid table. Hybrid tables, yeah. A premium feature. Uh, but if you ask me as an ex uh, business professional, real time reporting is not necessary. If you if you if you are looking at reports to 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 uh, to make some decisions for the last three years performance. Yeah, it's important for operational reports like if exactly. you need to yeah to 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 see if some yeah part of the machine yeah will close it's closing to an end or something like this. Yeah, of course, but this is really, really small number of situations. I would say in yeah, in most of the cases, as you said, real time is. Uh, it uh, sounds funny, <laughs> but, yeah. but it doesn't work. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, in order to improve performance, mm -hmm. should we design an ET ETL process with data flows instead than Power BI desktop? Ooh, that's a wide question. Uh, if you can, the, the, yeah. data flows, in my opinion, of course, it's uh, the, the substitute if you don't have access to a real data platform products uh, such as Enterprise Data Warehouse or something like this. So they are here to... Uh, Make your life easier if you don't get access to to IT department and then stuff like this. But uh, it, it's a broad topic. I, would, I yeah, exactly. But in in terms of uh, individual Power BI per, uh, report performance, it it has no difference. But yeah. in case where you have multiple people, 
developing their own models and using the very similar data sources, then yeah, makes sense. using makes data sense. flows yeah. makes more yeah. sense. Oh, yeah, because of reusability and yeah, creating exactly. yeah, things like we have in, in those uh, traditional data warehouses like single source of truth. You have people who are responsible for creating quality data in data flows and then they can be reused uh, yeah, across the organization. Yeah, the good point, Gina. Tougher for debugging, yeah. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Please feel free to ask. Uh, I want to add one more thing reg regarding calculated columns. Maybe we, I shouldn't call it calculated columns. When, when I need to add some additional column that I can generate from the original data, I usually prefer Power Query side instead of calculated columns. It's, it is usually much faster, of course, depending on the logic behind that uh, mm -hmm. column. Power Query is much better solution for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's also my rule of thumb. If if I can create in Power Query, uh, then I will create in Power Query, not in DAX. DAX is the last stop. I would exactly. say. Exactly. Yeah. It's best to create them in the original source if you are able to do this. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I think we are done, Nicola. Thanks a lot for your time, effort, no and explanations. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for joining. And uh, yeah, hope that to see you, Halil, in, in one of the events in person. <laughs> uh, I hope that as well, Nicola. It will be my pleasure to meet you in person. Thanks. Same here. Same here. Same, okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great day, evening. Uh, night. <laughs> morning. <laughs> okay. Yeah, morning. Thanks a lot. See everyone in the next See meetup. You. The bye recording bye. will be available in our, on our YouTube channel in two weeks if you need to rewatch it again. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Ciao.